All right, everybody, my name is Arissa. I am the Vice President of the Women in STEM program that is hosting today's research symposium. So before we get started, please make sure there's no food and beverage. Beverage is here, water is completely okay. Just make sure it has a lid on it. Um, and also we have two, we have our Slido. So if you scan the QR code or just enter the link on the screen, you can ask questions throughout the presentation. And then at the end, um, we'll make sure that whichever questions are at the top, so you can choose which questions to kind of give a higher score to that you're interested in. Um, those will be the ones asked in descending order. Um, so without further ado, it's my honor to introduce Ms. Gargano. Um, she currently serves as the assistant head of school. Um, she oversees all aspects of Harker's academic affairs. So that's working with department heads, division heads, department chairs and teachers across all three of our campuses. And she does that to ensure that we have a smooth, high quality and well articulated education. This is her 24th year working at Harker, and this upcoming school year is going to be her 20th year serving as the assistant head of school. During her first three years, she served as an upper school math teacher and department chair, and she also oversaw the community service program and our honor council. She even led an all girls, an all girls junior engineers technical society team, so she was basically part of wisdom. I would like to thank Mr. Organo on behalf of all of WISTEM, and without further ado, go ahead and moderate the alumni team. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I first want to take the opportunity to welcome our alumni today to our stage, um, and really thank you all in advance for taking the time to share your stories, which I know will ultimately help our current students optimize their talents and their opportunities as they learn about and from you. So thank you. As a K-12 administrator, um, it just brings such pride in my heart to see all of these students come back who I've seen grow up, some of them from first grade. Uh, so it's just a really special day for me. Now, the purpose of this panel discussion is to hear and learn from the stories of our alumni, all of whom were in similar shoes to the students who are in our, our audience today. Each of you, um, you know, each of our alumni have had different courses and journeys, both within and outside of Harker. And it's important for us to showcase that a successful post-Harker life can present in so many ways, uh, as I'm sure will be evidenced by the end of this panel. Additionally, our motto, K to life, is more than just an adage. Uh, we truly believe that you will and always are a part of the Harker family. So thank you for coming back today. As such, we're still interested and invested in your future, and I'm personally excited to hear more about that today. So let's, let's not further delay and begin. So first, again, I'd like to welcome each of our alumni today uh, to introduce yourselves. Please state your name, the grade in which you first joined Harker, your graduation year, the college you attended, and what you're currently doing professionally. And we'll start with Carolyn uh, and then go down the line. Perfect. So my name is Carolyn Wang. Um, I joined Harker in 2003, so right before high school. Graduated in 2007. Um, went to MIT right afterwards to do study math and economics, and I am now um, chief financial officer of a film and TV production company. Thank you. Hi everyone. I'm Prague. Um, so I joined at Harker in sixth grade. Um, I graduated in 2012. Uh, went to Wash U in St. Louis for college. Um, and currently, actually, as of this past week, um, I started a new job, and it's at a chip design startup. Hi, everyone. I am Allison Rigger. I started Harker in ninth grade and graduated in 2013. I did my undergrad at Cornell, and I recently wrapped up my PhD at Stanford and now a postdoc at a startup called Sandbox AQ. Hi, I'm Renee Tam. I joined Harker in first grade, and I graduated in 2013. I got my mass, uh, my undergrad at UC Irvine. I studied chemistry, and then I got my master's in chemistry from UC San Diego. I am a cosmetic chemist, so for the past three years, I was an R&D chemist for a brand called Jafra Cosmetics, and now I recently moved to Ross Organic, who is a supplier of specialty ingredients within the cosmetic company. Well, thank you for sharing those introductions. That will give our audience, of course, a background and a foundation to contextualize your answers um, and all your responses. Uh, 
to the questions that I know I'm very excited to ask each one of you. Please note that I will ask each of you a question very unique to your experiences, and I'll ask that these last about two minutes. Um, so I will begin with Carolyn uh, and ask her the first question. When you attended Harper, we were still a relatively new high school. She hadn't even seen this building yet uh, when she came back, so that was exciting for her. Uh, and in fact, you were enrolled in our very first science research course. And as a result of that, um, you wrote and received recognition for a Siemens paper. What lessons did the Harker Research Program uh, and writing a Siemens paper teach you that has carried you on to your post-Harker life? Yeah, it's been a really long time. It was actually kind of a shock to come here. And um, my boyfriend and I, we were looking and we were like, where is Nichols Hall? And we, you know, we actually thought maybe it was Dalton. So, so anyways, um, to answer your question, right, um, just thinking about things that I've kind of taken away from just the process of research, right? Um, I think the first was, you know, don't be scared to set lofty goals. Like I remember Chris Sutarjo was kind of like one of the first students that actually did see things um, at Parker. And I remember kind of sitting in at that time, Main Hall, right? That was where we did kind of the big speak, speaking engagements, right? And I remember thinking, you know, maybe, maybe I can do that, right? And it was kind of just such a random thought you know, I hadn't really done much in, I mean, I hadn't done anything in research at that point, but, um, you know, it kind of set that goal and, you know, gave me something to work for and, you know, I guess it happened, right? So I think one, don't be scared of setting lofty goals. Um, I think the second thing I really actually took away from the whole process was actually um, don't, you know, just don't, don't, don't be stuck to a single thing, right? Like kind of be able to bob and weave as you go, right? And I remember, you know, I went to research in a lab, right? And, you know, I had really one goal was to write a paper, right? Or get far enough, write a great paper. And halfway through kind of my time there, um, you know, I just, I realized, you know, the project wasn't progressing kind of at the speed that, you know, I wanted to. I mean, science progresses at its own speed, right? Um, and was feeling really down, actually. And um, I, think, I think Mr. Matthews, who was in charge of the research program at the time, I think he had, you know, we had talked about it, and he said, you know what, just start writing, right? Like, you know, kind of just move forward one step at a time, right? And so that was what I did. And, you know, it all worked out in the end. So, you know, I think it was really good advice and it was just something that, you know, whenever I'm feeling overwhelmed now, and like things aren't going my way, I'm like, okay, you know what? Like, don't panic one step at a time, right? Um, and then I think maybe the third thing I really took away from kind of the process is actually, you know, obviously like science is extremely important, technical concepts, progress, et cetera, right? But being able to communicate that in like a very clear, effective way um, is also really important. And I actually felt that when writing the paper, you know, it was as much a technical exercise as it was a writing exercise. Um, you know, that's something that I, you know, constantly struggling with today, you know, in my job, we're doing a bunch of financial analysis. We're constantly thinking about, you know, what, how do you present all these numbers to people like, you know, a head of film, for instance, right? Who don't really want to see numbers, right? But, you know, need to know these things to make decisions, right? So, you know, I think it's always a balance, right? It's like, obviously, Technical is important, but you know, think about the audience if we presented. Present. Thank you. All good advice, and I love kind of if you work hard, don't be afraid of just getting started with something. So thank you, Prague. I have a question for you. You earned a degree in computer science and then pursued a medical degree at NYU Medical School. Once your clinical rounds began, you decided to take a new path, serving as CEO and founder of a tech startup. How did you determine that making such a change? professionally was right for you, and what advice would you give to Harker students who might think that they have to have their kind of whole path decided by the end of high school or maybe even college? Yeah, so I think kind of um, kind of echoing uh, you know, some of what we've already said, right? Um, definitely, like, it may seem, you know, it, it may seem like, oh, there's this sort of like defined path, right? And like you have this all planned out in your mind and everything, and maybe you hear from people too, they're like, oh yeah, you know, like I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this, right? But I think oftentimes, you know, from what I've heard and from what I've seen, right, that's seldom the case in reality, right? Oftentimes, you know, in theory, you might, and, and even after the fact, right, you might say, okay, you know, point A, point B, point C, but in reactuality, you're kind of going all over the place, right? And then you end up, you know, somehow you end up over there, and then you're kind of creating a story in reverse, right? Like looking back, you're saying, okay, like here's a story kind of of, of where I was heading, right? Um, but in actuality, there can be a lot of exploring and kind of, you know, bobbing and weaving, right? Um, uh, to use that term, right, along the way. And so, I think for I think my advice there would be like you know don't be afraid to explore right and don't be afraid to try out different things right and sort of see 
what it is that you want to do. And even if you feel like you've kind of chosen the path, right? If you feel like that's not the path that, that resonates with you, right? And it's not really what you want to be doing, then don't be afraid to make a change, right? Um, and to switch to something else. Um, you know, I think, I think these decisions, you know, especially big decisions, right? You know, when I decided to leave med school, right? Um, like when I joined this, I joined this early startup, I joined a different, like it's now my third company, right? Um, uh, you know, these are not easy decisions to make, but, uh, but I think in retrospect, I'm really glad that I made these decisions, right? Because it's been the better choice for me. Um, you know, I just joined this new company. It's totally different, right? Um, previously I was at MedTech startups. This startup has nothing at all to do with, previously I was at MedTech AI startups. This startup has nothing to do with med tech or AI, you know, it's like applying tech for chip design, right? It's a totally new area. And the first like three days has been just nonstop, just like learning from everybody else, right? All these industry veterans, um, like the founders, right? On how does chip design actually work, right? And how do you do these things? And it's totally different for me. It's a total 180, but it's really cool. I'm really enjoying it. And, you know, it's, uh, I think it's a very specialized area and it's, you know, it's something totally different um, in a totally different domain. So I think don't be afraid to, try different things. Um, and also, even if you feel like you've committed to something, right, and you feel like you're along a certain path, right, don't be afraid to make a change if you feel like that's not working for you. Thank you, Prob Prague. And I think bobbing and weaving might be a theme for today. So thank you to your both. Allison, now when you were here at Harker, you were known for several talents, but I think many of us remember you as serving as a star pitcher on Harker's softball team. In fact, during your 11th and 12th grade year, you recorded over 200 strikeouts each year, earning the respect of your teammates and your opponents alike. In fact, you pitched a perfect game one day, making Harker sports history. Yes, the yay, I heard one clap. Yes, in your senior victory. <laughs> Uh, in your senior year, you led the Harker softball team to its first and only WBAL title, and you were chosen as MVP of the league in your senior year. Your coach, Raul Rios, who is still with us, tells us that you are a natural leader and you lead by example. You have since gone on to earn a PhD in applied physics from Stanford. How did your experience as a high school student athlete prepare you for the applied physics research lab at Stanford, really any of your post-Harker life? Thank you for the question. Um, I think being a student athlete at Harker prepared me in a few different ways. Probably the most surprising is that softball was actually the basis for my first science project, which I presented here at the symposium. Uh, as a pitcher, I depended really heavily on my curveball. And in order for breaking pitches to actually move when they cross the plate, you need to put a lot of spin on the ball. You need to pull out rotations per second. So my dad and I set out to measure how much spin I was putting on my pitches. Uh, we drilled a hole in a softball, stuck a magnet in, wound a coil of wire, and used Faraday's law of induction. And that was a really great experience. It gave me a lot of basic skills, um, learning how to build things, uh, programming in LabVIEW, and applying some of the stuff I was learning in Dr. Adler's pre-calculus to analyze the data. Um, and that gave me a strong foundation, and I think it helped me land an internship at NASA Ames through UC Santa Cruz, which was in an electrical engineering and material science lab. And that was my first exposure to a university lab setting. And I got to further build my skills, and um, when I got to Cornell, I did undergrad research. And you can see how all of these skills were building upon each other and snowballing from this softball project. Um, Another thing that I learned as a student athlete is uh, leadership and composure under pressure. So as a pitcher, you're involved in every single play, and you have an opportunity to set the tone of the game and set an example for your teammates. So if things are, um, are not going your way, it's important to stay calm and um, just think about what you're going to do next. Because if you don't do that, things are going to spiral out of control. And that's something that Coach Raul and Mr. Hudkins and Mr. Fowler really emphasize is resilience and staying calm when things aren't looking good. And it's a really valuable lesson for science as well because not every experiment that you try will work out and you have to figure out how you're going to move on from that and what you're going to do next. And lastly, I think a lot of student athletes talk about this, but time management was really valuable. Balancing a very uh, challenging academic schedule with a demanding athletic schedule, along with 
other extracurriculars like wisdom and orchestra. I had to learn how to uh, move between the different contexts and use my time very efficiently. Uh, and that's really helpful um, in grad school and in work. Um, in grad school, you often have a main project and a few side projects in case you know, a tool goes down in the clean room for your main project, you can work on something else. And at work, I, I've been able to apply this and balance a few different projects at a time. Thank you, Allison. And I think really what that highlights is that no matter whether you're involved in science or wisdom or athletics or performing arts or debate or whatever you're interested in and involved in, all the skills that you're learning will feed into, you know, and help you in your post harper life. So thank you. Uh, Renee, I know we talked a little bit about this before today, uh, but you have an undergraduate degree in chemistry and a master's degree in analytical chemistry. You have worked as both an R&D chemist and a research chemist in two different beauty industries. This is not always the path that one assumes as a chemist. Can you speak to the diversity of work that someone trained in chemistry can pursue and what drew you to your current work in the beauty industries? Yeah, so one of the reasons why I love chemistry is because it's so fundamental and it can be applied to so many different industries that we have. For example, chemists can join the pharmaceutical or biotech industries, but they can also be involved in food science or environmental science. Um, if you want to go into the more legal aspect, you can join toxicology or regulatory bodies. And in my case, I joined the personal care and home care industry and really this started as a dream job idea that I had since I was a young little girl. Since high school I would watch a bunch of different YouTube videos on like beauty gurus who would talk about makeup products and skincare products and they would teach like how to make DIY skincare products at home and I would be like oh my god like how do I do this? How can I make this? And I would look at the ingredient list on bottles and I would see like a bunch of random chemicals and I'm just like, how does this make a body lotion or how does this make a shampoo? And I was so fascinated by the idea and I really wanted to be a part of that product development process and create products for people that use it every day in their lives. Thank you. Back to you, Carolyn. Uh, now, you experienced much success in the traditional sense of the term. At Harker, you were seen in semifinalist, as we mentioned. You then attended MIT, earning a degree in mathematics, became a CFO at a successful entertainment company in LA. Now, as such, it appears that throughout your life, you probably, I would assume, were surrounded by individuals who were somewhat success or results driven. Uh, an environment that may appear competitive to some, especially as a female and predominantly male fields, did such potential competitive experiences create difficulties at times or did it serve as a positive driver in your life? So it, I, I think it's, you know, it's a really interesting question, right? And that like, I think the word competition has a lot of negative connotations, right? And I think, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, I can consider myself actually a pretty competitive person, right? Um, but. I've always had the perspective that, you know, I'm running my own race, right? Like I'm competing against myself, um, which I hope has kept it from being too toxic. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think for me, you know, it was harder to kind of keep that mentality, I think in high school, you know, or, or in high school, college, even right after college, I went into investment banking, right? Where, you know, you're surrounded by peers who, you know, have similar interests, you know, you have similar resumes, um, you know, and you probably haven't lived enough of life to really know what you want, right? Um, but sometime in banking, there was like kind of a men mentality switch for me where I went from thinking, okay, you know, what's this prescribed path, you know, to success? Do I really care about it? Is this what I really want? You know, to thinking, okay, well, forget all that. Like, where do I want to be in 10 to 20 years, right? Um, and, you know, I had this moment where I'm like, you know what, I want to be in entertainment. You know, I think I want to be on the finance side still. Um, and then the question is, how do you get there, right? And it, that kind, that mentality switch kind of basically led to, yes, I'm still competitive. I'm constantly thinking about, you know, how do I be better? Where do I want to go? You know, what can I do to get there? But you're thinking less about kind of the people around you, right? Um, it's gotten a lot easier as you get further in your career. Like now, you know, when I'm competing for a job, it's like, this is who I am. These are my strengths. These are my weaknesses. You know, this is my experience that I bring. And if that fits the company and that, you know, and I'm the right executive, that's great. And if it isn't, you know, no harm, no foul, right? Um, so, yeah, I would say that I think competition's a very positive aspect of my life. Um, and I think, you know, it's just, you need to make a concerted effort to look less around you and more internal, right? 
Um, I'd also say actually one really good part about being in competitive environments is you're surrounded by so many great people, like, you know, who, you know, if you just stop thinking about, oh, like, am I being compared to this person? You just realize you've got just a great peer group, you know, and a lot of those people I still call, text, you know, try to like constantly ask them for like, hey, you know, I've got this problem. How would you think about it? Um, and, you know, really rely on that group. So. Thank you. You know, one of the things that we like to say here at Harker uh, to reinforce those ideas is comparison is a thief of joy. And again, just appreciating the brilliance and the, the resources you have around here, around you. And it sounds like that pushed you further. Yes. yes. Wonderful. So Brog, during your professional journey, you combined your love of computer science and medicine. And as such, you became a founding engineer of a company whose mission was to increase the adoption of AI in healthcare to help doctors catch deadly diseases earlier. With that as your background and considering the daily workflow of doctors and the disparities and inequities in healthcare delivery, what role do you think technology and healthcare will play in the future? Yeah, so I think it's a it's a huge space, right? Um, there's a lot of opportunity, right? Um, I think in healthcare, you know, there are, you know, we do a lot of good, but there's also a lot of processes that can be improved, and there's a lot of room for technology to further improve and streamline um, aspects. So I think it's going to become more and more prevalent, um, especially now. You know, there's this huge thing around kind of generative AI, right? Maybe some some of you may have used, you know, ChatGPT, right? Um, that like everyone's talking about, you know, and I'm sure there, are, like, you know, I imagine there. are so many applications, right, for that even in healthcare, right? You could imagine, like, maybe a doctor could use this, right, to figure out, like, you know, given a set of, uh, you know, with a patient coming in, right, um, you know, figuring out, okay, like, what's going on with this patient, you know, maybe even patient, like patients, right, directly, you know, if, instead of going to a doctor, right, you can imagine, okay, like, you maybe start by asking ChatGPT, right, um, you know, and then maybe ChatGPT helps, like, gives you some additional information and then also tells you, okay, should you see a doctor, right, um, for this, right, should you go to the ER, right? Um, something like that. So I think there are there are a lot of opportunities, right, um, to sort of use technology, right, to streamline processes. Um, you know, I think I think it feels like healthcare. There's um, there's a lot of kind of legacy as well, right, um, and a lot of a lot of sort of processes. And so I think you know some of that, yes, like there's a reason for the perhaps slower pace of kind of change or innovation, right. Um, you know, it is it is it can be a lot of life and death situations, right, and it is pretty important. You know, maybe it's it's uh, you don't want to be iterating as quickly as, say, some other sort of consumer startup, right? Like, you could imagine even say something like, you know, Facebook, okay, if the site, like, say if you, say, say if there's like a bug or something and the site, you know, goes down for a minute, you know, or a few seconds, right? Like, okay, fine, you can reload the page, right? Um, you know, maybe you don't want that to happen. You don't want that, like, you know, maybe it's a little bit more critical, right? If it's like during a surgery or something, right? Um, so understandably, right, the pace of innovation can be slower in healthcare, but that being said, right, there's a lot of opportunity and um, we're just beginning to see, I think, the, the ways that technology can be applied to sort of improve that healthcare, right? Both for like empowering patients, for improving access to care and um, improving sort of uh, equity, right? And distribution of care as well in terms of um, reducing those disparities. Thank you, Prague. Now, Allison, in your undergraduate program of engineering physics, you were one of two, so one of two women in your major's graduating class. Can you share your experiences in this male environment and how it impacted who you are today? Um, yeah, so I think being one of two women in my graduating class was very different from my experience at Harker. Um, I found it a lot harder to build a community in my class um, I felt like I, because of the foundation I built at Harker, I could keep up or excel academically, but socially it was more challenging, um, in part because some of the guys gave me some unwanted attention, and you can use your imagination on how uh, conversations with 20-year-old boys can devolve. Uh, so uh, I was still able to make some good friends in the department, though, and also by taking electives outside of the department, like in material science, and uh, playing softball in the club softball team was also helpful. Uh, so I learned um, to uh, really embrace my close friendships and to reach out for help when I needed it. And I also learned what kind of work environments I wanted to be in in the future. Thank you, Allison, and thank you for persevering, because uh, I know you're making some substantial change, and so thank you for continuing to move forward despite all of that. Um, 
So, uh, Renee, while in graduate school at UCSD, you worked on the impact of environmental and indoor air pollution. Currently, you work for a company that's a leader in the sales of eco-friendly and natural ingredients in personal beauty and home products. Uh, can you comment on what we should be aware of as far as environmental indoor pollution and or the products that we put on our skin? Yeah, so I think when we think about air quality, I think traditionally we talk about outdoor air, but in reality, us as humans, we spend 80 to 90% of our times indoors. So really, for me, I think the discussion on indoor air quality is just as important, if not more important. So what I learned during my time in master's school is that the chemical compounds that are found in indoor environments can come from either activities we are doing inside the homes or specific direct products that we're using. So for example, cooking or using fireplaces, that can contribute to indoor air pollutants. Also, the cleaners that we use to clean our surfaces or the personal care products that we use, those can also be direct sources of chemicals that we are releasing into the air. So when I learned that personal care products can be a direct source of indoor air pollutants. I think this really strengthened my desire to be in the cosmetic industry even more because I really wanted to develop safe products for everyone who we use it every single day of our lives. And something that I've learned by being in the industry is that there's always science going around on the ingredients that we use in our products. And we are always talking about, is this safe? Is this not safe? Do regulations need to be adjusted accordingly? And the beauty industry is always evolving around the newest science that we learn, and we're always adapting so that us as chemists, we are formulating the products that are safe for us. So I think it's always good to know that um, work is never boring, honestly, because things are always changing, because new science is always being developed. But I think it's exciting to know that like formulators really do care about the public health, and we're really trying our best to make some safe beauty products. Thank you, Renee. And Carolyn, during one of the initial meetings to plan for this panel, you mentioned that, I may not know everything, but I know how to figure it out. And you attribute this to your Harker experience. Can you explain what you meant by that? And relatedly, what advice to Harker students can you give to ensure that they leave with similar problem-solving skills? So I think the context that, that had come up with was I was kind of just talking about the various steps in my career, right? So I had gone from MIT to investment banking, right? In investment banking, you tend to learn everything on the job, right? And then from investment banking, went to entertainment lending internally and jumped to company legendary entertainment that does, you know, they did the Godzilla, King Kong, those type of films, right? And, you know, I think that first jump was you know, I felt like I could probably nail maybe 50% of the job, right? Like, and, you know, 50% of it, I've just never seen, right? Um, and, you know, my subsequent job after that, I went to work for the CEO at a company called Anonymous Content. They're in talent management, right? Similarly, you know, maybe could understand 50% of the job, 50% was new. And um, in my final jump to become the CFO at New Regency, right, um, I felt like maybe I could do 20% of the job and 80% was new, right? And I think each of the steps has been you know, it's a little scary always, right? You know, you're jumping in a job, you want, you're excited, you want, you know, for me, one of the big things is to be able to learn and grow, you know, you're looking for something new, right? Um, and I think kind of just over time, you know, one of the things was having the confidence to be like, okay, you know what? I only know 20% of the job, but I'm smart enough, I can figure out the remaining 80%, right? And I'm smart enough to think that I can do it probably pretty well, right? Um, so, you know, I think that mindset, like, you know, it's, it's, it's based in problem solving ultimately, right? And it's something that I think, you know, here, college, you learn math, you learn science, you know, you're focused on kind of whatever you're learning in front of you, right? But I mean, I think there's an underlying bit of like, okay, there's a new technical concept that's complicated, you haven't seen it before, but like, you know, break it down, kind of take it piece by piece, right? And I think it's really just a way of thinking, right? And, um, you know, that's kind of just, I guess, following me in life. So I think that's really what I meant. Well, thank you. And that sounds like very similar to what you were saying earlier about your student's paper, right? If you didn't know what you were getting into at first, you just wanted to accomplish this task. But you had confidence in yourself and you went step by step. Yeah, and I think it's it's iterative, right? Like, obviously, the first couple times you do that, you're like, oh my gosh, this feels like a roller coaster. But as you do it more and more, you could probably take on more and more, right? Um, uncertainty. And, you know, it's like a muscle, right? So, 
Thank you. Well, that's good uh, advice for our students. So Prague, you mentioned a little bit before, so I'm not going to kind of ask the same question again, but we're talking about, you know, how your life hasn't necessarily been linear, as I don't think anyone's is linear, really. Uh, point A doesn't go to point B to point C. So with that context in mind, what advice would you give, you know, high school Prague? Or yeah. any advice you would want to give high school Prague? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I think, um... Yeah, the advice I would, I would give to myself, right, or to any like high school, I think, would be to, um, like, don't be don't be afraid to figure out and kind of go out there and, and do what what it is that you want to try, right, and what you want to do. Like, I think there there can be a lot of like, oh, you know, kind of looking at um, looking at what people around you are doing, right, and and there can be a lot of that comparison, right. But again, kind of um, tying back to like, you know, what we what we were what we were saying right about that, like, you know. Um, focusing more on kind of what it is that that you're interested in doing, right? And and not being afraid to sort of do that, right? Even if it's maybe different, even if it's not the same as you know or similar, even if it's totally different from what people around you are doing, right? Like I think it, you know, it's it can be helpful, right? You can sort of see what people around you are doing, and definitely it's it can be very helpful, right? To talk to people and, and get a sense, right? And also just like you know whether it's like a difficult problem you're trying to figure out or whatnot, right? Definitely getting support and kind of having that peer group. Um, but then beyond that, right, don't be afraid to figure out what it is that you want to do, right, and do that, even if it's totally different from what, what everyone else around you in your peer group is is doing. Thank you. Very good advice, Pog. Now, Allison, as you already mentioned, you currently work as a postdoctoral scholar at Sandbox AQ, a company that's leveraging the exponential power of AI and quantum technology. Uh, as we already referenced already, we all know about ChatGBT. It's a recent example that we know uh, showed us the power, really, of AI. Uh, in quantum technology, I know I have a number of friends in the industry and the amount of progress that's made over the last few years in terms of really making substantial changes is really amazing. Um, so with all that, how do you feel AI and quantum technology will impact our lives in the future? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really big question. Um, I think um, they both have great potential to impact our lives. I think, as you mentioned, uh, AI is something we're already seeing the impact of it. Um, and I'm, I'm more on the quantum side of things, so and maybe I'll speak to that. Right. And I think quantum, uh, for many quantum technologies, it's much farther out. It's uh, maybe 10 or 20 years for um, quantum computers to reach a certain level of maturity. Uh, the quantum technology that I'm personally most excited about is quantum sensing, which is what I'm working on at Sandbox. Uh, quantum sensing basically turns this problem of our quantum bits or qubits are too sensitive to our environment, and so they're losing their memory. That's the problem for quantum computers and quantum networks. And we flip it around and we say, oh, our qubit is responding to the environment. What can we learn from that? Um, and we're, the team that I'm on at Sandbox is using quantum sensing to um, do magnetocardiography, measure the magnetic fields of the heart. And we um, also incorporate, we build the quantum hardware and we incorporate AI in denoising these data sets because our sensors are so sensitive, they're responding to all the fields, not just the field you want to pick up on. So we use AI to denoise and also to classify uh, the data um, and hopefully down the line help improve the speed and accuracy of clinical care decisions. Another uh, sandbox is spread across many different parts of quantum and AI. Um, another thing that sandbox is working on is quantum security. So um, quantum computers, um, when they become mature enough, will be able to break our current encryption schemes and so if you want your data to be protected for the next 10 or 20 years, you want to um, start encrypting using methods that are resistant to both quantum and classical adversary attacks. Um, so that's another way that um, we are uh, we're addressing some of the changes that will come with quantum technology. Sounds like that's an industry to really look at in the future. A lot of changes going forth. So thank you, Allison. Renee, I am told that when you began looking for a job uh, after you completed your master's degree in analytical chemistry, the job posting you first pursued said two to three years of experience required. You, of course, didn't have that two to three years of experience, but you applied nevertheless. Congratulations. Uh, and then you got the job because you said the woman who interviewed you believed in you. Uh, 
what qualities or talents do you believe you exhibited that led that female interviewer to take a chance on you? Yeah, I remember this moment like it was yesterday. It's a core memory in my head. I was on LinkedIn. I was looking for a job, and I saw a job posting saying fragrance chemist company Jaffra Cosmetics. And I was like, oh my god, if I don't apply for this, I'm going to regret this for the rest of my life. So I was just like, click, submit resume. And when I went to the interview, yes, I didn't have any experience in the cosmetic industry, but I had a lot of research experience from past internships and from my graduate school master's thesis. So I was kind of telling the interviewer and showing her what projects I did in the past, what I learned during my research experience and how I problem solved and troubleshooted challenges. And I think for her to understand that I know how to research in general um, made her feel comfortable and in inviting me on board because she didn't have to teach me how to research. Research comes from experience and any research experience in general is better than no research experience. And learning the technical stuff on the cosmetic chemistry side, like what ingredients to use and what do they do, that's kind of easy and you can learn on the job and learn from books and articles. But teaching someone how to research, that really comes from experience. So with past experience um, that I had, it kind of gave me an advantage over other candidates. And I think the other thing that I was telling her about during my interview was my passion for the industry and why I wanted to join and what I wanted to do and what I wanted my career to look like. And I think she saw the fire in me of being in the industry and wanting to learn. So she felt that even though I have to train this girl on the very basics on how to make a batch and how to develop a formula, she thought it was worth it and worth the training because I was just so into it and I'm so willing to learn. So both past research experience in general and the passion for the industry combined gave me the job offer. Thank you. And it seems like that love of learning, that passion to want to learn more, which we talk about at Harker, is part of it. And it actually alludes back to something our keynote this morning said about the importance of mentors. Having a mentor that believes in you uh, is really important. Uh, so we'll go back to Carolyn. So Carolyn, um, as, you, as we all grow and develop, there are many element, elements that shape our identity. I am told that you feel like, uh, not surprisingly, being an Asian American female has generally shaped uh, your academic life, your career, and perhaps even your leadership style. Can you elaborate on the ways in which you feel uh, your identity as an Asian American female has shaped your academic and professional life? Yeah, so actually it's funny because as you were talking about this, I, I almost wanted to chime in, right? But um, so just, you know, as a, I guess in general, going back to like the female experience of banking, right? Um, so in banking, you know, you come in with an analyst class, right? And, you know, you've got, I mean, for me, I was in tech media, telecom banking at JP Morgan. So you came in with an analyst class of about 10 people, right? And basically what ends up happening is at the end of each year, you know, you are essentially ranked against your other analysts and that determines your compensation, right? Your bonuses. Um, and it also actually, you know, your ranking is like something that's kind of standardized across the industry. So, you know, when you're looking at private equity jobs or hedge fund jobs, they all want to know, you know, what was your ranking, right? Um, so, you know, I had looked at like kind of the analyst class in front of me, right? And it was, there was one of these weird kind of things you notice where, you know, all the females tend to be clustered, clustered to the bottom, right? And everyone, you know, knew this, right? Um, and I think when, you know, I looked at each class and you looked at the individuals, it all made sense, but it was just like one of those things that was a little weird. Um, so, you know, going into kind of just the experience, like you have a central staffer that kind of like delegates kind of work that you do, right? Like they put you on different projects. Um, and, you know, there are, this is how you're learning, right, is through these projects. So, you know, there are good projects that tend to be, you know, more modeling intensive, have a chance of actually, like, happening, right? I mean, so really backing up, I guess as an investment banker, you know, what you're doing is you're basically advising, you know, in my case, tech media telecom companies about raising debt, raising equity, you know, making acquisitions or, like, you know, capital allocation decisions, right? Um, so there are good projects and there are bad projects, right? And you know, I think being an MIT major, an MIT math major, you know, I came in and I was like, you know, I, I want a technical project, right? And, you know, that was something, you know, initially didn't ask for, you know, kind of just took whatever projects were given to me. A lot of them were PowerPoint based, you know, moving things around on the slide. Um, but eventually started asking and asking repetitively. Um, and, you know, there was this kind of thing where, you know, I think actually 
it, a lot of it comes down to like, I think women tend to be, you know, I, I had this experience where basically it felt like women had, basically you had to prove that you were competent to be taken seriously versus I feel like a lot of times often men are perceived to be competent and they'll prove it otherwise. Um, and I think that was actually really clear in staffing, right? Like, you know, I think a lot of these men that, you know, I felt probably were less technical than me were getting these really good projects. And eventually they were kind of like, okay, you know what, we'll put you as second analyst on this very technical project. Um, and I got lucky that the first analyst ended up getting pulled on to a live deal. So I became essentially the first analyst on the project, did very well. And after that, you know, things unlocked, right? But I think, you know, in general, some of this may be body language, maybe kind of just one of those things where, you know, we don't think to ask. Um, but I think kind of these small things early on, you know, like, you know, not being staffed on a good project, for instance, right? Because maybe, you know, women tend to be like, oh, you know, I've never done this, maybe I can do it versus, you know, I think in general, men tend to be more confident and say, hey, you know what, I think I could do this, even though they've never done it, right? Um, I think those changes over time, you know, after two years, makes a huge difference, you know? Frankly, like, better projects means you're a better analyst, which means you have better job opportunities, you're compensated better, and, you know, those things build. Um, so I think, you know, as I just think about being a woman, I think that that was kind of like, you know, one of those pivotal moments where I was like, oh, wow, this is, you know, I mean, everyone talks about inequality and structural issues and, you know, this kind of like a, a wake up call almost, right? It's like, okay, this is an example of how it's, it's very subtle, you know, you don't even necessarily notice it, but you have to be aware, right? Um, the flip side is I think now actually like, you know, for me being an Asian female and really a male dominated environment, I actually have found to be at this point, very like helpful. I know that sounds weird, but um, you know, I feel like as an Asian American female you, from MIT, I'm assumed to be smart, <laughs> um, and you know, I definitely I'm like I'll, I'll take that advantage at this point, right? Um, you know, I don't have to prove that anymore, right? And actually, like you know, in a lot of environments I'm in, often I feel like you know, I guess the people I'm working with tend to be very aggressive, and I can kind of play this role that's you know, I can because they're per you were perceived as smart, you can kind of play this role where you can give, give advice, you know, um, and not be taken as like an aggressive force, right? And kind of be one of those, I don't know, like I don't wanna say bridges, but essentially kind of a bridge within our management team, right? Um, so I feel like in some ways kind of that Asian American female identity has kind of helped lead to my niche and what I do now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, pluses and minuses. Yeah. Sounds like it had kind of impacted in a positive way your ability to really hone in a really good EQ. I, I, I don't know if I would say I have good EQ, but like, you know, I think it's one of those things where like at the beginning you're like, oh, okay, this, these are the negatives, but like, you know, at a certain point you're able to kind of embrace those stereotypes, right? You're like, oh, okay, like, you know, there could be positives as well. Well, thank you for sharing that. So Prague, back to you. So we've already talked about your, uh, your varied path and things of that nature, but when did you realize that your true passion really laid in entrepreneurship? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question too. Um, so I think for me, actually, um, this actually goes all the way back to Harker, right? So I think in high school, like one of those like Wednesday long lunches. I mean, I hope you guys still have those because I really enjoyed those. Um, like we had a we had a panel of some entrepreneurs who came actually. It was like other Harker alumni, I think, um, and they basically talked about entrepreneurship. Um, so I like popped into this panel, you know, I like stopped by and, and whatnot, and um, I think I had a question or something afterwards. So I like I stuck around, you know, asked one of the one of the entrepreneurs, um, got to know him a little bit, you know, got to talk, got to, got to chat with him for a little bit, and um, you know, at the end he was like, and, and I told him, you know, I was like working on like an iPhone app and stuff at that time, and um, you know, he had kind of he, he asked me too, like, okay, what was the process like and all that, and I was like, you know, it was it was a lot harder than I realized initially, right? And like if I had known how how difficult it was going to be at the beginning, right, I'm not sure if I would have actually done it, right? But then it's like once you're kind of in the process, right, then it's like, you know, um, it just sort of like, it's sort of, you realize over time, right, incrementally. Um, and in some ways it's a good thing, right? Because, you know, if I had known that upfront, maybe I wouldn't have done it, but then kind of, because it's incremental, right, I actually did end up doing that and, and publishing this app and whatnot. Um, and he was like, yeah, like a lot of times with entrepreneurship too, right? It's like, you know, you don't realize until like you're in it. And sometimes in some ways that's a good thing, right? Because it means you end up doing more. Um, but then I think at the end of this talk, right, um, I think, I think he asked me, he was like, oh, like, you know, so like, do you want to be an entrepreneur? But I was like, I'm not sure, like, I don't know, like, maybe we'll see. And then, and then, and then his response was just like, yeah, like, I think you're going to be an entrepreneur. Like, I can, I can see that, you know, like, 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 I see, I see you in front of me, right? And like, and like, I, like, you might not, you might not think that right now, but like, I feel like, you know, ultimately that's, you know, you're going to do that. And, um, you know, it stuck with me, um, what he said, you know, I think it was, it was a good inspiration. Um, and, uh, you know, even, I guess, through, 
you know, like at the end of high school, right? Doing these like iPhone apps and then even undergrad, right? I was looking for like kind of those like entrepreneurial kind of ideas and like side projects, you know, I did like academic research, even there it would be like trying to figure out, okay, like, can we build an iPhone app for this? Could we like, you know, potentially commercialize this, right? Is there some way we can kind of bring this finding in the lab or this like concept and, and have it kind of be applied more broadly, right? To have an impact. Um, and then, you know, even I think in, in med school, right? It was like, you know, a lot of times on the side, right? I would try to figure out, okay, like, you know, is there something we could do and whatnot, right? Definitely it was a lot busier in med school, so not as much time for maybe the, the programming or you know, development work, but still just kind of thinking about like, okay, you know, what are some potential ideas and all that. And um, so I think, I think for me, it was in some ways looking back, right? It was maybe building this point of like, okay, you know, I'm gonna jump to industry and like, I really wanna be, like initially coming into med school too, right? I was interested in med tech and I was like, all right, I wanna learn this domain, right? Medicine is highly specialized, right? And so I, I have this sort of tech, you know, comp sci background, but I need to learn this medical side of things, right? And at that time I thought, okay, maybe I'll do like academic medicine, right? I'll practice, I'll do some research, and then perhaps like be involved in maybe a consulting or advising role, right, with startups, um, with like medtech startups. But I think then what I realized in med school was that um, for me, it was what, what, what I really enjoyed was more the engineering side and the actual like building. Um, and then basically at that point I was like, all right, like, it, like really what I should do then is it makes more sense to work in industry, right, as an engineer. Um, building these sorts of products, right, that doctors or other healthcare professionals or consumers, right, um, can use. Um, and so for me, what it became about then was applying technology to have this impact at scale. Um, and, you know, initially it was kind of, I mean, you know, a lot of it has been sort of med tech in terms of my background, but, um, you know, now I think it's sort of transitioned even beyond that, right? And it's like looking at something totally different, right? Looking at like uh, semiconductors, right? Um, and uh, having, you know, again, sort of having, you know, looking at that ways to apply tech there, right? So, you know, I think for me now it's been, I've become pretty open in terms of domain and industry and vertical. And, um, you know, I think for me, the common theme has been sort of applying tech to have that impact at scale. Um, and uh, like, you know, also I think making sure that I'm learning and growing, right, in the process, whether that's learning a new industry, right, and figuring out that, or learning a new skill set, or, um, you know, or kind of going into more depth, right, um, uh, in a given area. Thank you, Craig. It sounds like you had a drive and the knowledge and that, again, love for learning. Uh, but like what like Renee said, also having a mentor who believed in you. You believe in yourself, but it feels so much uh, like higher when someone else says you can do this. Yeah, I think there's that. And then I was going to say also, like, I think, you know, um, at these different jobs that I've had as well, right? Like in my first job, I feel like I had a really good mentor where, you know, coming out of med school and jumping back into software, right? Like four years later, right? Like industry had kind of advanced and um, also, I hadn't done any formal like software internships before. They had all been sort of research, um, and so having a having a mentor there, right, to figure out okay, how does software actually work in the industry, right, and how to sort of get in, how to sort of break into this, right, and, and do that. Um, going from like you know, just studying sort of I guess the book side of things in terms of comp side to like actually like you know doing things in the industry. So I think that was really helpful. Um, at my second company, I actually feel like one of the things I missed there was. Um, not having a strong sort of mentor. And I think that's something that I found in my most recent job, which I'm really, uh, really appreciating, right, is having, again, that strong mentor, right, to teach me all about, okay, how do semiconductors work, right? And like, like you know, someone with, someone actually in this case, he had, like, everyone, in the, everyone else in the company has like 10 or more years in this industry, right? Um, and I'm like, the, I'm like the person joining now who's like, I have no idea how this stuff works, you know? Um, and I think everyone is so willing to sit down, right, and teach me about about all these things and understands that I have no idea, you know, that this is all new to me, right? Um, and so even after meetings, right, explain like, okay, like what, you know, if you have any questions, right, anything you didn't understand, right, um, anything that was confusing, right, so we can talk through these concepts, right, and, and, and get the background there. And I feel like that's been so helpful, right? And so I think definitely having having a good mentor is really important, I think, for, for that growth. Thank you. And Allison, I will ask you a question I asked Prague earlier. Probably know that, but if you could go back in time and speak to high school Allison, what advice would you give her? Um, I think I would tell her it's all going to be okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I was in high school, like probably every other Harker student, I put a lot of pressure on myself to excel academically. And I think I felt that I was recognized for my athletic accomplishments and I felt like nothing I was doing academically was going to be enough. Um, and I thought I wanted to be either a scientist or a doctor, so I applied to a bunch of internships, including some medically, like medical ones, and I got rejected by all of them, except for the NASA Ames, UC Santa Cruz one. And that set me on more of a physics-oriented trajectory, which has been really great. But I kept medicine kind of in the back of my mind this whole time. 
And now as a postdoc, I get to apply my physics expertise to a problem that relates to healthcare and medicine. And so I think looking back, it all makes sense. Every acceptance and every rejection like uh, made me who I am. And I can see now that softball wasn't a distraction. It gave me community at Harker. It gave me an outlet. It even gave me, let me have my foot in the door for my first science project. Um, and physics gave me a toolbox to address problems with and a lens through which I can see the world. And right now, my interest in medicine is like giving me some purpose with the project I'm working on. It's uh, always life takes a life of its own and you can only kind of see the path in retrospect. So good advice. And Renee, of course, I'm gonna ask you a similar question. So you could go back in time and speak to high school Renee. What advice would you give to her? I think the first advice, kind of similar to what Prof touched upon earlier, was you know stay curious and just keep learning the things that really interest you. Um, there's so many things in this world, and find what fills your soul with happiness. Find what gives you fulfillment, excitement, passion, and just go for it. I think it doesn't hurt to try, and if you fail, that's fine. Failure is good. It's natural. It um, builds character at the end of the day. So. Um, stay curious, keep doing what you want to do. And second thing would be don't underestimate the power of first impressions because meeting people and making those connections and networking, you never know what doors can open um, from those encounterments with people. So just be you and be a good you. <laughs> Thank you. And you never, yes, that's great. And you never know what encounters are going to be the ones that are really going to impact you later. Exactly. Like you can never expect things to happen the way you think. So whatever doors that open, it will happen in ways you would never even think about from like years ago. So. And I know we're about out of time, but I have to ask uh, Carolyn, of course, that last question, uh, since I have asked everyone else, go back in time. What advice would you give high school Carolyn? I try to keep it short because I think it's a reiteration of a lot of what everyone else has said. I mean, I think it's dream big, you know, um, don't be scared of change. Like I, you know, dream big, but don't be scared of change. I think actually really is the advice. Like I know when I was in investment banking, I was you know, kind of looking at it and I was like, mm, I like this, but do I really like this? And you, and basically thought, you know, really wanted to do entertainment. Right. And I, I actually, to be honest, looked at all aspects of entertainment. I bought a book on writing, you know, I was basically thinking about, you know, do I maybe don't want to be an assistant at a talent agency, right? And I basically cold called a bunch of people. Um, well, I mean, cold LinkedIn, I guess is really the term. <laughs> right? Um, and I just basically looked at like, looked for anyone who had switched from business to like a more creative field, like, you know, somewhere in entertainment, and also the actually the vice versa, right? Anyone who was in entertainment and switched to a business field, and sent out maybe like 20 or 30 just messages about like you know hey just want to pick your brain and um you know ultimately ended up kind of making a side change right like i'm still in finance but on the entertainment side um but yeah no i, I like you know i think it's important to dream i think it's important to kind of you know pursue what you want but not be scared to change careers are extremely long um you know and you, know, you just want to keep it interesting Thank you. And I think we're going to close out this session. So thank you to all of you. And thank you for all of you who came, who are learning about and from our alumni. All right. So really quickly, we're going to ask one of the Slido questions. And it can be super short. Um, but a bunch of people were wondering what the best class you took in Harker was. It may not be offered still, but you can still tell us. <laughs> You know, actually, like one of my favorite classes was like, I think in the lit department, it was, I think, great novels. I don't know if they teach that anymore, but um, okay. they do. Okay, yeah. Dr. C used to teach it. She, she was a phenomenal teacher. And, you know, I think we covered four, four books. And I'll be honest, can't even remember what the books were, but I absolutely loved it. So. I think for me, I would say um, Dr. Adler's uh, pre calc class, actually, pre calculus. Um, yeah. I think for me, like, I think, you know, um, yeah, Dr. Adler, I mean, Dr. Adler's charisma and, you know, um, also just studying the class in terms of, um, yeah, the learning and just like the, the approach in terms of, um, we had a, so we had a, I guess, like a pilot at that time where we actually had, um, 
uh, like upperclassmen as well, um, like in the classroom. And so I guess it was somewhat of a, it was like a combination where it would be a lecture, but then also like working on some of the problems in class and having like these upperclassmen help us out um, as well, kind of go around, right? And if you, if you had questions or whatnot, right? And kind of go through as well to see if you were doing it correctly. And I feel like that was just really cool in terms of both being able to, um, both being able to learn, right? And sort of, uh, sort of understand the concepts, but then also being able to apply them, right? Um, and do it that way. So, you know, I think, I think it was a great class all around, um, and yeah. I think that class have lots of friends enjoy Dr. Adler's yeah. classes. Allison, what about you? Um, I have the same answer, actually. I took three classes with Dr. Adler, pre-calc, multi-area calc, and WQ, and all of them were fantastic. It was just like the flipped classroom approach I thought was really effective, and differential equations, it was like he got straight to the good stuff, like the electrical engineering goodness of the PQ, which was, which was really good. I, I haven't had a, as good a teaching of it since. So, okay. Renee. I can't really pick my favorite. I will say like my top two that come to mind. I think what I love about Harker is just the specialty classes that are electives that we have to offer students. One of them would be the architecture class. I don't know if that still offers, but we learned from an architect. And it was just like, I've, I don't know anything about architecture, so it was really cool to kind of experience that and kind of understand like, okay, this is what someone actually does in real life, because who's going to teach me architecture? No one. Um, and then the second one is like, I think it was like a bio biotech class. I, I don't know if that's the name of it, but it was like, we would kind of learn like biotech techniques and like, um, I actually, because I took that class, I kind of knew the techniques to be a biochemist, I guess, in biotech industry. So I wrote that on my resume and actually that gave me my first internship because I was saying, I know how to do PCR. <laughs> so that's great. That's wonderful. All right. Thank you so much once again. And thank you to Ms. Gargano. Um, it is now lunchtime and it's free lunch. So if you make your way over to Manzanito Hall, um, lunch is provided, and I'm not sure if the keynote for Rohit is still going on, but that's sort of at 11.40, so if you're interested, um, you can go and head over to the Art Pack. Thank you.